Now, you've already mentioned that you studied industrial design and your own releases in Magic have had amazing packaging. How do you think Magic packaging could be improved? Um, well, I think Magic packaging in general has really improved. You know, you walk into the, the Vanishing Ink booth at the convention and I pick up these boxes and they're like magnetic flaps and beautifully you know, embossed gold details everywhere. Absolutely. I think the level has gone way up because, you know, you, you buy even a, a bad prop, it comes in a great box. <laughs> but the one thing that's inconsistent, in my opinion, is is the tutorials. Right. You, you buy a, a $275 item, you go to the link and the video literally is a guy with an iPhone sitting on his dining table. The audio is crappy. He's talking for 40 minutes without any kind of structure. You can see him even like reach over and hit stop and start. You know, if you're selling an, ex, you know, you're selling a product, I think the every, every part of it has to be up to a certain level. Yeah. And packaging has definitely gone better. But for some reason, the video quality and audio quality has kind of stayed the same. Fair. Now, look, you've obviously got all your lovely cameras and glass, but you also take a lot of pictures with your iPhone. Um, what are some tips that you could share for people to improve their iPhone photography or videography? Right. First, first, I'll give you two, uh, two, two tips at least. Uh, the first one is clean your lens. You know, you, you have a professional camera, all professional camera lenses have lens caps. The iPhone doesn't. So this picks up all the grease from your fingers and your skin and your face and whatnot. Oops, sorry about that loud noise. We'll edit that. <laughs> um, so the first thing I do is I take my shirt and I just give a little bit of a wipe and your pictures become crystal clear. Now, on the opposite side, sometimes I want a little bit of haze. I'll actually take my fingertip, just rub a little what they call nose oil, nose oil on it. And just give a little bit of a dab and you can get a little bit of a frosty look like uh -huh. a, like a 1970s you know uh -huh. uh, you know playboy <laughs> <laughs> or you can give it a little bit of a swipe and then you get these flares in the lights that are like in different directions just by pulling it in different directions oh and that would so change the bokeh of the exactly it, it changes the flare so the flare is like this it could be vertical lines horizontal lines oh. crisscross yeah a lot of fun and um, I think if you search hashtag nose oil. hair flare, hair flare or finger flare, I have posted a few things like that on over the years. The other thing is learn how to change exposure. Um, a lot of times when you take a picture, the camera, any automatic camera, not just a phone, wants to kind of average the scene. Uh -huh. Like as to, it generally tends to brighten the scene. So half the time when I take a picture, learn how to t touch and change the exposure. With an iPhone, you can hold it down for three or four seconds. You get the autofocus exposure lock. Then you drag your finger down, and that darkens the exposure to what's more cinematic so, and, and not what's too bright. So just those two tips alone, I think, will improve. And learn composition. It doesn't take any technology to learn composition. Where do you put things in the frame? Is it, at the, is it in the thirds? Is it in the corner? Is it dead center? Is it, you know, what's your background? Is your background complicated? If your person's standing next to a bunch of complicated items, the, per, the your subject won't stand out. But if you just rotate and say, hey, move to the left two feet, and then take the picture, now your subject could be more, stand out more and be the focus of your photo. Well, I've learned something. Now, you have talked, but okay, this is another one, from my research that you may deny being true, but according to my research, you have talked about how important you think it is to make a trick your own, particularly when there's something kind of fashionably in vogue that every magician's doing. Um, I'm not sure a, where you're getting... Wait, a, wait, where is this research coming from? <laughs> the internet, so it's true. Let's you sure that's not on. Shunagawa? Is that Shunagawa? <laughs> <laughs> so you don't think it's important to make a trick your own? I, I believe it is. So I yeah. there we go. What's the process to make a popular trick personal and different from the way everybody else is doing it? Because over in England, um, every worker is doing Omni Deck and Ring Flight. For that's example. what I heard. That's what I heard. <laughs> everybody. There's some law. Uh, 
so what's the, is, is there a process that you follow to take a popular trick and personalize it? That's well, the question. I'm not the expert on this because I don't do magic for a living now. So, sure. you know, if I had to do magic every day and I had to pay my rent with it, I might be do, doing Omni Deck because I um, might. By be the doing... way, I wasn't maligning Omni Deck. Oh, for Solid sure. Trick. It's a great trick. It's like. Solid trick. Huh? If, if a song is number one, and it's a great song. Sure. You get tired of it. People get tired of it. It doesn't make the song a bad song. Mm -hmm. You're just tired of it. Yeah. Right? It's still great, a great song. So. Um, you know, there was a time when I was doing Sponge Rabbits. I couldn't get rid of it. And it's a great trick. Yeah. And people argue all the time, well, then do it. But mm -hmm. I was trying to be different and trying to do something um, that was me. And Sponge Rabbits are not necessarily, necessarily me, but the, but the reaction to Sponge Rabbits is addicting, correct? Mm -hmm. It's so good. So I, I can explain by example, just like... Uh, a lot of the time, it's just I just avoid them t totally. There's a lot of amazing magic that comes out every week from Vanishing Ink and, and, and a lot of other places. No other I, places. I, <laughs> but <laughs> that, I don't, I, personally, me, I don't buy them. I don't even play with them. I look at them. I get fooled by them. I get inspired by them. But if I can think of my own version of doing that, and it takes a long time. It may be years before you think of your own version of it. Uh, the example I like to give is when I was performing at Illusions, every single magician did ring flight at every table. Great trick, right? Everyone sure. loves it. But you would think that if you were in an environment where people are coming to see a magician, that you would want to stand out. Right. So when Chris Kenner was there, he, he did ring flight for a while and was realizing, hmm, I need to stand out. And Chris thought hard and developed his ring on shoe. So instead of ring flight, it would appear tied to the laces of a little baby tennis shoe. And now he stood out. People came to the restaurant saying, hey, I saw this guy do it on a, where a ring vanished appeared in a key case, but you should see this guy do the little tennis shoe trick. And he stood out. It was a completely different trick to the layman just by making it a tennis shoe. And that's an example of making it your own. And... Um, and I, I'm not the best at making things my own. I'm, you know, when I used to do magic, half my, half my act was David Williamson magic because he was sort of my idol. Um, but I did, I love object and visual magic. So I did a, a whole routine with, with gum that was very original. I did a routine with a Carmex uh, lip balm jar. I did a whole routine with pencils. Um, uh, I dropped the ball bearing out of a marker, which I'll teach in the master class. And I was drawn to visual magic, and I feel like I make, made that my own. So if I did my act, I would do two Williamson effects, and then the other 70% would be my own magic. So that, I guess you could say that would be making something my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, out, out of all of the work that you've done with David over the last... 28 years is there one thing that stands out that you're most proud of um i would have to say that the whole um it's it's pretty public knowledge now the whole alien spaceship thing was was, was a lot of work we started working on that in 2012 2011 so it's over 10 years we've been working on that and it's evolving every week. It's still evolving. And, you know, it took a lot of people, a lot of teamwork to get all that done. And I was very happy to be part of a lot of it. And not just from the illusion design standpoint, but also just, you know, fine tuning the script from beginning to end. You know, you know, when David takes a letter off the alien and reads the letter about Blue and his family, We've rewritten that th 300 times. Sometimes we'll, before the show, we'd hand write a new note on there and put it on the alien so David, when he reads it, has new lines. Um, just figuring out all the music, the music changes, figuring out the spaceship, figuring out, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of work. And I, I remember at one point, you know, David wanted to produce a 36 foot spaceship. Uh, I genu genuinely thought this would never happen. And after a lot of 
a lot of hard work from our team, you know, Chris, me, David, and, and, and our crew, you know, it is, I believe it's the highlight of our show. It's my, my favorite part of the show. You know, if I don't watch the show, I'm working backstage, but I have friends in the audience, I'll go out and sneak out and watch a reaction. Because that's, to me, a great moment to see. You know, it's a Star Wars moment, right? Absolutely. You know, when when, when J.J. Abrams, the director of, you know, Lost and Star Wars and and uh, and Super 8, came to the show a couple years ago, the one thing I wanted to ask him was, and I did after the show, which is, you know, you you have seen spaceships, spaceship models. You've seen CG spaceships on the big screen. You've seen spaceships sitting there, you know, on set that are actual production items. But I want to know what it felt like to have a spaceship appear over your head, flying over the audience, coming out of nowhere. And, and he did say, and I'm very proud of this moment, we are all very proud of this moment, not just me, that he did say he felt like that kid in E.T. looking up at the spaceship flying off. Oh, and, and he said it was a up. moment. Yeah, he said it was a moment that he doesn't get to experience very often. You know, we're magicians, we're jaded. He's a magician himself, yeah. and you know, he he can't see a scene without you know tearing it apart and knowing of the course. technology. But at that moment, he felt like a kid again, and that was just you know, boom. It made all of us feel really absolutely. Good. Now, what aspects of working on such a huge show? Do you still find challenging today? Um, it's just pushing the envelope. It's just, uh, you know, when I work on my own things, I kind of take my time and I, I get to a lot of plateaus where I'm like, this is good for now. You know, mm -hmm. if I get inspired two years from now, I'll work, I'll work on it. But with David, it's constantly pushing me and our team forward. It's, he, he is such, such, a, such a high benchmark. And... I always say, I joke about this backstage all the time. He proves me wrong all the time. He'll tell me something and I'll genuinely, genuinely think, this is ridiculous. This will never happen. This is absurd. <laughs> it doesn't need, even need to happen. Why are we doing this? And then I take a breath and I work on it. We work on it. You know, Chris and I are a big team backstage, so we're constantly sure. working together on things. Um, and there's a point in time where I go, fuck, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> he proved me wrong again. And that to Damn me is very, very rewarding because it really pushes me to go past anything I would have ever thought of going going so far. And he really pushes me and our team. And and it is rewarding. You know, sometimes we, we, we take it for granted, but sometimes, sometimes I look back at things we've done and it's like we would never have, would have gone that far if he didn't push us to that level. When Kenna dropped that you were going to be doing the masterclass and asked on his socials what you should teach, the one thing that kept coming up in the comments, and you have alluded to it, is the gum trick. Can you explain what that is, and are you going to be sharing it? What is? It? What did he say? The gum remember. trick is what everybody, oh, everybody commented. I wish I could, but... Unfortunately, first of all, it's broken. It's made out of some plastic that's got brittle and has broken. My girlfriend has tried to uh, remake some of it with modern materials, but I haven't put my time in. I, you know, I have so much to teach, and it's sort of kind of a work in progress. Okay. You know. Well, okay. It's, well, it's maybe one of the it's one of those routines year, you that can come all, back and do it again, and then yeah, your girlfriend. Yeah, I won't have that much material. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, it's also, it's a work in progress. It's one of those things that I was thinking that a lot of the effects take three moves. You shouldn't need three moves to do one effect. You should have a maximum of one move to do one effect, right? Okay. So there's yeah. moments in that gum routine where I have to do a move to get ready, do a move to execute, execute effect, and do a move to clean up. That's, uh, not, that's not a good thing to teach. You want... Too many moves. Economy of motion. So mm -hmm. one day. One day. One day. So what are you going to be covering in the Masterclass, Homer? Well, I'm working on it. Right now, it looks like this. So if you're on the YouTube channel, it's a giant post-it note. There's a giant board full of post-it notes. And what I do the colors session... mean? Well, this is session one. Okay. Session two, session three, and then the live. So I'm going to try to fill up three full sessions plus a live. And... 
I've got bullet points, meaning these are the main items. Like if you, all you saw that day was these, you'd be happy. Mm -hmm. Then lots of filler because I have, uh, you know, I'm afraid of not being good enough all the time. So <laughs> there's a bunch of filler and details, gags over here that I want to do, but I'm not sure how to implement them because they're kind of like side hustles, right? So how do I, how do I talk about this and then jump to a side gag? Do I leave the set, enter a new set? <laughs> Do I take you out to my backyard and and go? Let's let's talk about my favorite gag to do in a hotel room. You know, <laughs> so that is what that is in progress. I'm really thinking about it. I'll, let's see, what am I going to teach? I have coin one for sure. Now remember, I taught coin one, coin two without talking, so yeah. they're kind of minimalist graphics. Just teach you the basics and some details. Well, I'm going to go in depth. I'm going to talk about details and finesse, and I'm going to talk about the tips that Chris Korn and Chris Kenner and, and all these great coin magicians have given to me over the years. After yeah, it. Yeah, because it's, After it's coin so, one so is if somebody's Korn's got, favorite trick. If somebody's got coin one or coin two, there'll be new... Oh, pl plenty, plenty of new stuff. New ideas, new endings. I'll go through the endings in detail. I should talk about angles and I can physically show you, like to cover this angle at a table. If you're a people over your shoulder, this is what you do. We'll do coin two. I'll be doing the whole uh, marker routine with a ball bearing, which was a very fun to do. You can throw that in anywhere in your act where you need it, where you have a marker. Um, and most magicians will need a marker at some point in there. Yeah, and I also have you know coin one, coin two use gimmicks, but I have great versions without gimmicks. So if you don't have the proper, are these magicians on here? If you don't have yes, the yes, yes. secret gimmick for the coin trick, you can do it with four normal coins. In fact, one of my routines, Flash Rice, which is an instant matrix, looks even better with just random change borrowed from a spectator. Or objects, a sugar packet, a bottle cap, a quarter. It looks even better. I've got uh, the False Pharaoh, which I published once, but I'll show you a little routine that Richard Coffin gave me. Uh, an idea for years ago. And I've got uh, some cool vanishes. I have to work on the bounce change, Derek Dinkle's bounce change. Um, and my contact lens routine I'll teach. You know, if I have time, I hopefully will have time if I'm not rambling like I am doing now. <laughs> and is that, that sound like a, that sound like a good master class? That sounds, that sounds incredible. Talk about lighting. I'm going to have my friend come, come out. I have a friend coming out. He's going to do like a, a vanishing candle or something, and I'm going to light him. I'm gonna start with uh -huh. like how people normally would light this, or like like worst case scenario, uh -huh. and then I'm gonna light them, and then I'm gonna show you how to light it with absolutely no budget. A lot of magicians that I know would appreciate that price point. Um, what what level of magician should attend this masterclass? Where are you pitching it? I believe I can. I do a lot of sleight of hand. I'm a I'm a move junkie, as they call it. But I believe that I have a lot to say as far as like timing and attitude and details that have nothing to do with skill. They have to do with mm -hmm. like thought process, framing, composition. So I, I think even if you're not into coin magic, for example, I believe and hope that you will get something about performing style, uh, timing, presenting to your audience and, and, and things like that. So I believe it's for everybody. but. Uh, but if you know me, I love moves. I'm, I spent the last two months with my lip Carmex box trying to get rid of the moves because it had so many moves in it. <laughs> so I, I believe I've streamlined. I'm going to show the original full of mm -hmm. moves, and then I'll show you some of the streamlined versions with at least three less moves. So it goes from 30 to 27 moves. <laughs> you just need four different and hopefully we'll Carmex I'm gonna, boxes. I want to make it fun and funny and have my dogs as featured. There'll be a dog cam. We'll cut... Whenever I, I flash, we'll cut to the dog cam. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> what are you most looking forward to about the Masterclass experience? Well, I'm interested in seeing, you know, I've never lectured before. So it's so interesting to see what the feedback will be. You know, are they going to hate it? Are they going to be like, this is ridiculous? <laughs> or are they going to, I'm not sure what they're going to like, but I'm just going to put my best foot forward. It's a great learning experience for me because... I'm taking magic that I haven't done in 30 years. Now, the, yeah. the Carmex box I haven't done since probably 1994 is the last time I thought about it. You know, when Chris called me and said, come over and work for David, 
my magic went into a suitcase and went into storage pretty much. Right, right. So being able to readdress those effects and kind of like, how would I do them now? Mm -hmm. Get the best brains of Chris Kenner, Chris Korn, Nick Defy, and kind of get like, how would I do this better? How would I put my new thinking of working with David for 30 years? How yeah. would I do it? So now when I do the Lipmatics box, this is my grandfather's Lipmatics box. No, I, I, I won't tell that kind of David story. That's, <laughs> but how, how does it, <laughs> but how, do, how does it fit me? Yeah. So uh, yeah, so it's a great learning experience for me and I hope people that uh, join the masterclass will get a lot out of it. I am 100% convinced they will. Um, Homer, we are so close to being out of time, but we always end the show with four quick fire questions. Are Have you to go. ready? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Fav favorite pizza topping? Soprasada. Say that again? Soprasada. It's like a cured sausage, Italian sausage. Okay. I'm a topping freak. You give me a hot dog, you won't see the hot dog anymore. You know, it's going to be no, onions was just, and relish was just and ketchup. A, something, yeah. a word that I was unaware of. In fact, I'm a little little sneak peek. Soprasada is going to make a surprise appearance in this masterclass. So everything ties in. It's what it's a, a package. Tease. Vanishing ink. What a tease. Uh, fav favorite. Here, here. Can I show you something? Yeah, please. I don't know if you can zoom in on this, but the opening. What does it say for the YouTube people? What is yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Suprasato opener. He's oh. right. He's not lying. <laughs> I'm not lying. It literally. And then we can see, but we also, YouTube people, got a sneak peek that his handwriting does actually look like that. It's not a font. Oh, I hired a, a scribe. <laughs> <laughs> look, this is meant yeah. to be quick fire questions. Scribe.com. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Well, that's why you have editing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, this. This, you'll either answer this instantly or you're going to need to think about it for five minutes. Yes. Favourite movie? Empire Strikes Back. Boom. Uh, Favourite person or people that make music? Rush. And finally, who would you rather fight? One massive Andy Gladwin or a hundred tiny Joshua Jays? A um, hundred tiny Joshua Jays being filmed by... A giant Andy Gladwin. Ah, that's interesting. You're the first person that's combined both options. But if it's a giant Andy Gladwin, you're not going to get a flattering camera angle because he's going to be too high. He could use an underslung steady cam. <laughs> You've thought it all through, Homer Leewag. Dude, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I really, this really a lot appreciate of your honesty and what you've shared. And it has been a right riveting interview everybody else go along to vanishingincmagic.com and click on the masterclass button or you can just go vanishingincmagic.com slash masterclass either will work and book your place to join us in the first sunday of november where homer lee wag's first ever lecture will take place and you can get a front row seat homer thank you so much for your time i do appreciate it and i hope you have a delightful rest of your day you too. Thank you very much.